Thank you, Reverend Stewart. And we begin our gathering tonight in a fitting way by reading Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Usually, if people know nothing about the doctrine that Martin Luther taught, the gospel that he preached, they are familiar with the hymn that he wrote, The Mighty Fortress is Our God. It could as well be called his psalm because he based that psalm largely on Psalm 46, which now we read. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Martin Luther was the reformer of the Church of Jesus Christ in the 16th century. We date the beginning of that Reformation for good reason in the year of our Lord, 1517. This year, therefore, is the significant 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, and that makes it especially timely that we offer a public lecture such as the one this evening. Martin Luther was God's man in history to form the body of Christ anew according to the biblical pattern by the gospel which that man, Martin Luther, <coughs> recovered and restored. As the church of Jesus Christ is precious inasmuch as it has been elected by God the Father, redeemed by God the Son, and formed by God the Holy Spirit, so was Martin Luther, the reformer of that church, important in history. Martin Luther was the reformer. All of his contemporaries were indebted to him and freely acknowledged this indebtedness. All of his colleagues expressed their indebtedness to Luther as the reformer. Some Notably, John Calvin developed the truth and carried the Reformation further than did Luther, but all of them developed the truth that Luther first recovered and then carried on the Reformation that Luther began. All later church reformers, for example, Hendrik de Kock and Abraham Kuyper in the Netherlands and J. Gresham Machen and Hermann Huxema in North America, stood on Luther's shoulders and expressed their indebtedness to Luther. What the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church in Northern Ireland and other true churches of Jesus Christ in all the world are, are Reformed churches. And what they enjoy, the gospel and its saving benefits, they are indebted to Jesus Christ's work in the Reformation of the 16th century 
for this gospel and its benefits. To be such a servant of Jesus Christ and to do the great work of Reformation, Luther had to be a certain kind of person, a special human being. I know the Reformation was accomplished by the word of God. In characteristic fashion, Luther himself freely acknowledged this. He said once, and now I quote, While I and Philip, that was his co-worker, Philip Melanchthon, and Amsdorf, that was a colleague in the ministry in Wittenberg, while I and Philip and Amsdorf were sitting at home drinking good Wittenberg beer, the word was going everywhere, reforming the church, and destroying the papacy. I did nothing. The word did it all. End of quote. Nevertheless, the Reformation did not take place apart from that man who came to know the word of God as the word of grace to his sin-stricken soul. That man who then proclaimed and defended the word of God. That man who was responsible for the spreading of the word of God everywhere in the world by his own preaching, by his converts, by his students, by his Bible translation, and by his flood, his veritable flood of writings. The man himself, Martin Luther, was the mouth of Christ that reformed the church. I have not seen that description of him before, but that, to my mind, accurately describes him. He was the mouth of Christ, mundum Christi. Jesus Christ had prepared a suitable vessel to carry his gospel, suitable physically, suitable mentally, suitable psychologically, and suitable spiritually. This makes it not only legitimate, but also necessary to look at the man Luther as we commemorate the 16th century Reformation of the Church. I do not intend tonight to engage in hero worship. I am secure about this temptation with regard to Luther because I have consciously faced and struggled with this temptation and have overcome it. Luther himself warned against this evil of hero worship on the part of his disciples. Objecting to his followers calling themselves Lutheran, he wrote, and now I quote Luther, I ask that men call themselves not Lutherans but Christians. Who is Luther? My teaching is not my own, nor have I been crucified for anyone. Why should it happen to me? miserable, stinking bag of worms that I am, that the children of Christ be called by my insignificant name. I am not anybody's master, nor do I wish to be. With the one church, I have in common the teaching of Christ, who alone is our master. End of quote. It ought to be perfectly plain to anyone who knows anything about Luther that he was a sinful man, and that his sinfulness defiled his best works, including his work of reforming the church. Let it be established that Luther was not the immoral man portrayed in the despicable Roman Catholic apologetics. I refer to such Roman Catholics as Cochleus, Denifle, and Grisar. The life of Martin Luther, both as a monk and as the Protestant reformer, was godly, as 1 Timothy 3, verse 2 requires of the bishop, Luther was blameless. But he was, he was temperate in drink. He was never drunk. He was never tainted by even the hint of sexual scandal. Luther lived chastely, both in single life and in marriage. When I assert that, if you are at all familiar with the condition of the church of his day, you will take note of the fact that this is a remarkable truth about Luther. He was a chaste man, both in single life 
as a monk and in marriage. Money held absolutely no attraction for Martin Luther. He never received a penny in royalties for his best-selling books, and his books were the best-sellers in all of Europe, and for his translation of the Bible into German. By the time Luther died, we are told, 500,000 copies of his German Bible had been sold. Booksellers became wealthy on the sale of his books. Luther received not a penny, nor did he care about a penny, because as he said, I have one concern, and that is that the word of God shall spread throughout all the earth. He was so helpful to the poor that anybody who came into Wittenberg knew to knock on Luther's door and receive whatever he asked for. So ready was he to give to the poor that his wife, Katie, finally the mother of six children and the manager of his household, had to regulate the finances of the Luther home so that Luther did not leave his own family destitute because of his love and care for the needy. Nevertheless, Luther had glaring faults. He had a temper, and he indulged it. Usually that temper was directed at the Pope and his minions, and so we Protestants will excuse him some of that intemperate anger. His language was sometimes vulgar in the extreme. A favorite description by Luther of the Pope was that the Pope was excrement in the devil's anus. And I have appreciably softened Luther's exact words in this quotation. He secretly advised on one occasion bigamy as the solution for the lust of the married defender of the Reformation, Philip of Hesse, and then lied to cover up when his advice became known. Luther was stubborn, bullheadedly stubborn, in defense of the defenseless position of a physical presence of Christ in the sacrament of the supper and of a physical eating of the body and blood of Christ in the supper so that even the unregenerated unbeliever partook of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Christ's vessel, Martin Luther, was earthen so that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of Luther. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. There will be no hero worship tonight. I will assuredly not engage in the abomination of a psychological analysis of Luther, as Eric H. Erickson did in his book, The Young Man Luther. Nor do I intend tonight to give a typical history of the life of Luther. Born in Eiselben in 1483, entered the University of Erfurt, in 1501, died in 1546, and the like. For a biography of Luther, I recommend two works. The outstanding book by Roland Bainton, Here I Stand, and a recent superb biography of Luther, Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas. But my purpose tonight is to demonstrate one outstanding personal characteristic of Luther without which there would have been no reformation. He was a man of conviction. <coughs> and this has revealed the very essence of the man Luther. And conviction is a trait that made him throughout his life and ministry a champion of the word of God. This was essential to his work as reformer of the church. What do we mean when we describe Luther personally <clears throat> as a man of conviction? Luther himself tells us what a man of conviction is in the opening section of his great work, The Bondage of the Will, a work that he wrote already in 1525. A man of conviction is a man who, to use Luther's term, quote, asserts, end quote, the truth. He takes a firm, open stand for the truth, defends it against all attacks upon it, 
and vanquishes the error opposed to the truth. That's Luther's own description of conviction. I quote him, By assertion, I mean staunchly holding your ground, stating your position, confessing it, defending it, and persevering in it unvanquished. End of quote. That's from his bondage of the will. He was, of course, there describing himself. And he was describing himself in his authorship of the book, The Bondage of the Will. That's what he did in that book. As a man of conviction, Luther, first of all, knew the truth. The truth being the truth of the gospel as revealed in Scripture. He knew the truth with certainty. He had no doubt about the truth whatsoever. In the second place, as a man of conviction, Luther confessed the truth. He spoke out on behalf of the truth. He spoke out in preaching in writing and in personal confession. He didn't keep quiet about the truth that God led him to know. And then in the third place, as a man of conviction, he defended the truth. He defended the truth against attacks that were made upon the truth. Then finally, with regard to his staunchness as a man of conviction, He stood for the truth. He did not yield. He did not compromise. He did not even waver in his confession and preaching of the truth. As a man of conviction, Luther took a stand. He took a stand courageously. The man of conviction was also, and necessarily, a man of courage. It is no exaggeration to say that in his day the entire world of that time opposed him and his confession of the truth of the gospel of salvation by grace alone. The entire Western Church and an impressive organization it was, the organization that we now know as the Roman Catholic Church, opposed him and opposed him bitterly. But in addition, the empire of that day The civil power opposed him with all its considerable physical might. All opposed him, and everything was on the line for that monk. His reputation, his livelihood, his church membership, his physical liberty, and his very life itself. It's one thing to stand for what is the truth when others support you. It's another thing to stand when standing means that you are alone all by yourself. He tells us himself that this sometimes troubled him. His enemies challenged him with the question, Is all the church wrong and you only, lowly monk in the wilderness of Germany, right? In the matter of the gospel, in his hour of temptation, he would struggle with this question. Even then, as a man of conviction, he stood. In his stand for God's truth, Luther showed himself a man of conviction. Let us examine Luther's stand. Everyone knows his stand at Worms in April 18 of 1521. Before the high-ranking representatives of the church, before the most powerful civil authorities of that day, and before the emperor himself, under the most intense pressure to recant his confession of the truth, when the very Reformation itself, which had just begun, was at stake, when everything was at stake, church, gospel, salvation, and the glory of God, Luther refused to recant. He stood. The question to him in that august assembly in Worms, Germany, was this, will you recant or not? 
And this was his answer on that memorable occasion. I quote, Your Majesty and Your Lordship ask for a plain answer. Unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, since they have often contradicted one another. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Modern scholars question whether the words here I stand and what follows are authentic, but that challenge to the authenticity of those words is wrong and foolish. These words are found in the earliest accounts of Luther's stand at Worms. Fact is, Luther said these words by his very deed itself. He stood, and that standing reflected, God help me, I cannot do otherwise. Amen. In fact, the night before, as he faced the test on the morrow, he wrote to himself, quote, With Christ's help, I shall not recant a single particle. End of quote. If this stand were the only stand he ever took, Luther would have been revealed as a man of conviction. But in fact, that was the pattern of his entire life. Again and again, on critically important issues of the Christian faith, at moments of crisis, Luther stood. He took a stand at Leipzig in 1519, in a debate with that champion of the Roman Catholic papacy, John Eck. The issue was that of authority in the church. What is the authority in the church? Is it the Pope or is it sacred scripture? Eck, of course, defended the authority of the Pope. Luther was forced almost by his clever opponent to express his growing conviction that the sole authority in the church and over the church is sacred scripture. Pressed by the shrewd Eck, his Roman opponent, Luther declared that popes and councils could err and have erred. He referred specifically to the decision of the Council of Constance that condemned Huss's doctrine that the church is the body of the elect and then burned the Bohemian. Luther also there flatly denied that the papacy is of divine origin. Cried Eck triumphantly, Luther is setting himself above popes and councils. Retorted Luther, quote, No, I am setting scripture there. End of quote. That was his stand for the truth of scripture alone as the authority in and over the church. Seemingly that was fatal for Luther's self-interests. Fundamental, however, it was to the Christianity of the Reformation. Luther took a stand. In 1522, Luther took a stand against what he called the heavenly prophets, men who invaded Wittenberg while he was kept for his own safety at the castle of the Wartburg. These self-styled prophets claimed revelations directly from the Spirit, as well as the power of miracles, and they disparaged scripture and preaching. They were the forerunners of the charismatics of our day. They caused a disturbance at Wittenberg. The leaders there, in Luther's absence, could not condemn these prophets and their movement. At great personal risk to himself, Luther returned, heard those prophets, condemned them, and drove them and their movement from the city and from the Reformation. The Spirit! The Spirit! They exclaimed. And Luther responded, I slap your spirit on the snout. It was not the Spirit of Scripture, 
not the spirit of the word of God. This stand safeguarded the Reformation from the dread evil of mysticism. Mysticism is a religion, supposedly, of the Holy Spirit that is cut loose from the Word of God. Mystical rapture is what Luther called this movement, and he described it as a movement that claims to be the passageway to God apart from God's Word. Luther took a stand against that threat to the Reformation and to the Protestant churches. In 1525, Luther took, on, took an equally decisive and important stand in the matter of the so-called Peasants' Revolt, the Peasants' Revolt. The oppressed peasants, we might say laborers on the farms, the oppressed peasants of Germany revolted against the authorities with appeal to Luther's gospel of the freedom of Christians. The issue was this at bottom. Would the Reformation faith become an earthly force for social, political, and economic change? Would the gospel promote revolution in society? Would the Reformation church give up its spiritual character that temptation is a real one, and it is still with us. And not only from the liberal left, but also from the right. Also from the right comes the plea to press the gospel into the service of realizing the utopian dream of a kingdom of God on earth, an earthly kingdom. Against that danger to the Reformation, Luther took a stand, a strong stand, he wrote a powerful tract entitled, quote, Against the Thieving, Murdering Hordes of Peasants, end of quote. In that pamphlet, he dissociated himself and the Reformation gospel from all such revolutionary movements and called on the authorities, indeed everyone who can, to, quote, smite, slay, and stab, end of quote, the rebel peasants. That was a thing that the authorities were more than eager to comply with. But that stand against the peasants was costly for Luther. It cost him and the Reformation the support of much of the working class. Nevertheless, to safeguard the gospel, Luther took a stand. If his stand against the peasants cost him the support of the lower class, his stand about the same time for the truth of the bondage of the will of the natural man cost him the backing of many learned scholars and of the humanists of that day. In 1525, responding to an attack on the Reformation's doctrine of the bound will by most of the famous and influential scholars of that day, especially the Dutchman, Erasmus, Luther wrote a book entitled The Bondage of the Will. He was responding in that book to an attack upon the doctrine of Scripture and of the Reformation that the will of the natural unsaved man is in slavery. It is therefore not able to respond to the call of the gospel or to respond positively to Jesus Christ set forth in the gospel. All of the learned scholars in the church were teaching the freedom of the will. That is, that the will of the sinner is free to accept Christ when Christ is presented in the gospel. And this famous humanist and Roman Catholic scholar Erasmus had just written a book, an influential book, propounding the freedom of of the human will, which of course means that salvation depends upon the choice of the sinner and not upon the grace of God. Luther responded in his book, The Bondage of the Will. In this book, Luther defended the fundamental truth of the Reformation. Man is a helpless slave of the devil spiritually, so that his salvation must be the sovereign work of God in his almighty grace. Naturally, of course, related to the truth of the bondage of the will is predestination. 
and therefore the bondage of the will confess the truth of predestination as clearly and boldly as any book that has ever been written. You can see that. If the will of all sinners is a slave to Satan and is unable to choose for Christ, the question arises, why is it that some human beings do respond to the gospel by believing on Jesus Christ? And the only answer can be that God has determined that they will respond and according to that determination works in them with the preaching of the gospel by his mighty grace so that their will is liberated and freed and not only liberated and freed so that they are able to choose for Christ, but liberated and freed so that they do choose Christ and believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. And that, of course, implies with regard to those who are left in their bondage and wickedness that God has not elected them, but has rejected or reprobated them. Predestination is also an important aspect of Luther's contention of the bondage of the will. That book and that confession of the bondage of the will humbled man and exalted God. This offended and alienated those scholars in that day who, although they desired a moral reformation of the church, were doctrinally one with the Roman Catholic Church regarding man as decisive in his own salvation. Luther took a stand. Then in 1530, in connection with the Conference of Protestants and Roman Catholics at Augsburg, as well as in later years, Luther stood firmly opposed to any compromise of the doctrines of the Reformation in order to achieve unity with the Roman Catholic Church. You see, as soon as the Reformation was underway, men were ready to sell out the Reformation for the sake of reunion with the Roman Church. Some of these men were Luther's own colleagues, Philip Melanchthon and Martin Bucer. The pressure for reunion was strong from both the church and the state, the state having a stake in the church's fortunes in that day. And Protestant leaders were compromising basic truths of the Reformation, including justification by faith and the truth of the Lord's Supper. Luther was barred from those gatherings and negotiations. He was an outlaw. But they had to pass their compromises past that great leader of the Reformation, and when they did, Luther said no to their compromises. And he carried the day. This stand, too, called for courage on the part of Luther. Indeed, a special courage. The appeal to church unity is powerful. The charge that one does not care about the unity of the church is a stinging charge. It was then, and it is today. But Luther stood as a man of conviction. The very act with which the Reformation began on October 31, 1517, the posting of the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg, was itself a stand by a man of conviction. Luther presented those 95 Theses as propositions for debate and discussion. But they were clearly Luther's rejection of the entire system of penance and forgiveness of sins of the Roman Church. Those theses had to do with the matter of indulgences, which indulgences, indulgences were an element of Rome's doctrine of penance. That is, Rome's doctrine that the sinner received the forgiveness of sins by something that the sinner himself must do, by meriting that forgiveness from God. Rome went so far in its teaching that forgiveness is something that the sinner merits, that it came to the absurd position that one could buy his forgiveness 
by purchasing indulgences. Those pieces of paper which the sinners bought were supposed to lessen the sinner's time and agony in purgatory, where according to Rome, sinners are supposed to be busy paying in part the punishment for their own sins. That system of penance is basic to the Roman Catholic Church, as well as being a great moneymaker for the Roman Catholic Church. Luther opposed Rome's system of penance because he was convinced of God's gracious pardon of believing sinners by grace alone in the gospel. Make no mistake, the nailing of the theses was a stand, a stand against the Roman church, a stand against false doctrine, and a stand for the gospel of salvation by grace alone. Rome at once recognized the stand taken in those theses as a mortal threat and got busy to destroy Luther, both ecclesiastically and civilly. These were all definite, necessary, and even dramatic stands affecting the Christian church worldwide and determining the Christian faith down to the present day. But Luther was also willing to take a stand in his own congregation and in the immediate sphere of church life and labor in which he was occupied. Perhaps this shows him a man of conviction even more than his more public and more famous stands. Right here, many pastors and theologians fall down today with dire consequences for the cause of Christ. The pastors and theologians to whom I am referring are bold enough to speak out against heresies and sins out there in the world or in other churches. But they are not willing to speak out against errors and false teachings in their own churches and denominations. They are afraid to condemn doctrinal errors and wickedness in their own churches and in their own circles. There are Reformed and Presbyterian theologians who oppose women in office today. But these same men are noticeably hesitant to take a stand against a figurative interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis and the rejection of the biblical doctrine of creation that this figurative interpretation involves. Also, there are evangelical pastors who are loud in their condemnation of abortion today, but who are quite silent about the evil of divorce and remarriage. And do you know, there are more children destroyed by divorce, the divorce of their parents, than are destroyed by abortion. And the figures of the murder of unborn babies in the United States alone is in the millions of infants. Luther was of a different stripe. He was fearless also with regard to errors within his own fellowship, we would say within his own denomination. Late in his life, Luther came out strongly, that's the only way he could come out, he came out strongly against errors both in his own University of Wittenberg, among his professional colleagues, and in his own congregation in Wittenberg. On one occasion, he preached against the decision of the faculty, that's the faculty in which he was also a member, the decision of the faculty that secret vows of marriage are valid. Now, it doesn't matter for us tonight what the issue was there. Just keep in mind this was a decision taken by his own colleagues, we would say, in the seminary in Wittenberg. Luther reacted against that decision of his comrades in these words in 1544, a couple of years before he died. I quote, I am angry, dear people, pardon me for God's sake, 
These harsh words proceed from a great zeal for keeping the doctrine of the gospel pure, and apart from this consideration, I would leave the lawyers, that's his description of his fellow professors, well alone in this matter. But they want to attack Christ in his government and to rule and confuse consciences. This is not to be tolerated. End of quote. In 1539, a few years previous, Luther mounted his pulpit in Wittenberg, Germany to preach one of the strongest sermons against drunkenness that was ever preached. I quote part of his sermon to his own congregation where this sin of drunkenness, at least in part, was going on. Quote, where one can find someone which will stop the Germans from swilling, I do not know. To sit day and night, pouring it in and pouring it out, is piggish. This is not a human way of living, not to say Christian, but rather a pig's life. If you are going to be a born pig and guzzle beer and wine, then if this cannot be stopped by the rulers, you must know <coughs> that you cannot be saved. For God will not admit such piggish drinkers into the kingdom of heaven. End of quote. This is the preaching, and this is the pastoral approach of a man of conviction. This is preaching that reforms the church, and that sees to it that the church continues to be reformed. Luther was a man of conviction. The question is, what accounted for this? In the answer to this question, we will come to know Martin Luther, the man. This will reveal him as he truly was. This will make him known as he fundamentally was. The real Martin Luther will stand up in answer to the question, what motivated him to be the man of conviction that he clearly was? Some explanations of his stands and of him himself must be rejected. Rome's explanation of Luther has been that he was an agent of the devil, indeed that he was demon-possessed. That was the contention of those two Roman Catholic scholars that I mentioned earlier, Denifle and Grisar. We reject this explanation of Luther on the basis of Jesus' response when he, Jesus, was charged with casting out devils by the agency of the prince of devils. You recall how Luther responded, quote, If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? End of quote. Matthew 12, verse 26. If Luther, if Luther was the agent of the devil then the devil was busy attacking his own kingdom, the Roman Catholic Church. And the devil is not so foolish as to empower a man to destroy his own fortresses and kingdom. The explanation of Luther's conviction was not that he was an agent of the devil. Others attribute Luther's conviction, his taking a firm, unyielding stand to his peculiar Indeed, sinful personality. Luther, they say, was a bull-headed German, determined to have his own way and intolerant of the thinking of everyone else. Most Protestants today would in fact criticize Luther as an unloving, intolerant, bigoted troublemaker. Most Lutheran and Reformed churches, I must sadly admit, would throw Luther out as fast as the Pope did, if not faster. And the Pope excommunicated Luther within three or four years of Luther's appearance. And when the Lutheran and Reformed churches cast Luther out, they would use the same words that Rome used when it excommunicated the Reformer. Quote, Arise, O Lord, a wild boar is destroying your vineyard. End of quote. As a matter of fact, Luther was not a nice guy. He was not the kind of man 
who is the popular pastor and theologian today. Careful to get along, eager to offend no one, skilled at avoiding taking a stand on every issue, the smiling, backslapping crowd pleaser. Luther was not that kind of man. Seminaries today specialize in producing nice guys. And that's why there are very few reformers, very few, in fact, who are determined at all costs to continue the Reformation of the 16th century. The Church of Jesus Christ is going under today because of nice guys. But the explanation of Luther as merely a self-seeking, self-assured, self-willed troublemaker and tyrant is mistaken. For one thing, that was not what Luther was like personally. Personally, he was plagued by severe doubts. Doubts whether he was right. Doubt whether God loved him. Doubt whether he was saved. Those were Luther's temptations, as he called them. But the Heidelberg Catechism in question 44 calls the hellish temptations of the Christian sometimes. Luther described such an experience he endured in 1527. Quote, For more than a week I was close to the gates of death and hell. I trembled in all my members. Christ was wholly lost. I was shaken by desperation and blasphemy of God. End of quote. That was in 1527, the year in which he wrote, A mighty fortress is our God. God delivered him from those temptations and gave him the certainty of that great song of the Reformation. So far was Luther from being stubborn and self-willed in personal dealings that on one occasion he chided his co-worker Melanchthon for his colleague's willingness to compromise the gospel at Augsburg. Luther said that Melanchthon insisted on having his own way in personal matters, but was ready to make concessions concerning doctrine for the sake of the unity of the church, supposedly, whereas he, Luther, was the opposite. Luther would compromise on personal matters, things that affected his own person and his own personal life. He was ready to give up what otherwise one might think he had a right to, but he was uncompromising with regard to the matters of God and the gospel. For another thing, Luther was not a rash, radical extremist who fought for every point as a matter of principle, regardless how this might disturb the church. On the contrary, Luther was a wise, careful pastor of the church. And he showed that vividly on one occasion, his wisdom and pastoral care and tenderness, when he had to make an emergency trip back to Wittenberg from the Wartburg Castle, where he was in hiding because his life was in danger. While he was gone, control of the church in Wittenberg fell into the hands of some men who were radicals and extremists. They weren't satisfied with the pace that the Reformation was taking in Germany. And so rashly they insisted upon certain changes for which the people, even though they were, allegiant, even though they were adherents to the Refor Reformation, were in agreement. The people were not ready for these developments and applications of the Reformation. For example, these extremists went into the churches in Wittenberg and destroyed all the images that were there. And these extremists also decided that on the spot, the members of the church should handle the cup, holding the wine of the Lord's Supper themselves, rather than that only the priest or minister should hold the chalice or cup. What these men stood for was a proper application of the principles and truths of the Reformation. But they were pushing these applications far too fast for the welfare of the people. Luther then had to make an, ex an emergency trip from 
the Wartburg Castle to Wittenberg, threatening his own life, throwing his own life in danger because the emperor's soldiers were on lookout for him to kill him in order to settle affairs in Wittenberg. And Luther took the position, those practices that you are insisting on are right and we'll come to that in time, but you're too hasty, you're too radical in pushing these things, you're disturbing the church by your haste and extremism. Luther would not push these aspects of the Reformation in a radical way, and he showed in that way that he was not a radical and extremist himself. So much was this this the case that some of his colleagues, particularly a man named Karlstadt, began referring to Luther as Dr. Pussyfoot and the armchair, the easy chair theologian. They ridiculed the reformer for refusing to be too hasty in his implementation of the practical aspects of the Reformation. So we will not explain Luther's being a man of conviction from his natural, impetuous personality. Why then was he a man of conviction who took a stand? There is a threefold reason why Luther was a man of conviction and therefore also a man of courage and all three of these reasons were plainly indicated by Luther himself. First, Luther was a man of conviction because he loved the truth. He did not merely love his own opinions, but he loved the truth of the Word of God. He loved Scripture. He loved the gospel of salvation by grace and all its teachings. Luther did not only know the truth, but he also loved the truth. He stated this as the motivation of his reforming work in the preface to his famous 95 Theses in 15. 17, quote, this is how the 95 Theses nailed to the church door at Wittenberg began. This, this, this is the, these are the opening lines of the 95 Theses, quote, out of love and zeal for the truth and the desire to bring it to light, end of quote, and what follows, out of love and zeal for the truth. Luther expressed his love for the truth in a touching way in his great work, The Bondage of the Will. When he says to Erasmus, against whom he had written the work, quote, You who never dropped a tear for the doctrine of Christ in your life, end of quote. What does that imply? Luther dropped a tear and more for the doctrine of Christ. I ask myself tonight, as I ask everyone who is sitting here, have I, have you, ever dropped a tear, dropped a tear for the gospel of Christ, dropped a tear because the blessed gospel of our dear Savior is corrupted, defamed, and denied? Luther did drop a tear. The reason why ministers and churches today will not take a stand is that they lack conviction. And they lack conviction because they do not love the truth. This is the cause, according to 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, of God sending them strong delusions so that they shall believe a lie. God hardens pastors and members of churches so that they are damned. And the cause is not that they do not know the truth, but the cause is they do not love the truth. Luther loved the truth. Second, the reason why Luther was a man of conviction was that he loved the church. He saw the people of God in their ignorance, superstition, and terror enslaved to the false teachings of the Roman church. And he loved the people of God as the elect, redeemed body 
of Jesus Christ. All He did, all He said, all He gave, all He suffered. And He did, He gave, and He suffered much, did Martin Luther. He did, gave, and suffered for the church. For her, for the church, He stood. Asked what that church was that he loved, Luther once replied, quote, Why a seven-year-old child knows what the church is, namely, holy believers and sheep who hear the voice of their shepherd. End of quote. The church is not an impressive institution. The church is usually not a vast multitude of people. The church is the gathering of those who hear the gospel of Christ, but then truly hear it, hear it in a belief in faith. Luther expressed his love for the church in a hymn that he wrote in the turbulent year 1534. The title of that song is, To Me She's Dear, the Worthy Maid. I'm going to quote, a section of that hymn, of that song. And keep in mind as you hear this quotation that it expresses the love of Martin Luther for the church. Quote, To me she's dear, the worthy maid, and I cannot forget her, I seek her good. And if I should write evil fair, I do not care, she'll make up for it to me, with love and truth that will not tire which she will ever show me and do all my desire. End of quote. The Church of Jesus Christ, the instituted Church of Jesus Christ, has few lovers today. And this is why few are willing to take a stand on behalf of the Church of Jesus Christ. Third, Luther took a stand as a man of conviction, because he loved Jesus Christ, his Savior and Lord. One does not prove this about Luther, but only observes it with awe. Luther's love for Jesus Christ. Luther wore his love for Jesus Christ, as they say, on his sleeve. He loved Jesus Christ in a friendly way as one loves his boon companion. He loved Jesus Christ in a personal way, as a wife loves her husband. He loved Jesus Christ in a vehement way. He loved Jesus Christ more than he loved father, mother, wife, child, possessions, and earthly life. You see, when you love Jesus Christ, you stand for his name. You stand for his people. You stand for his glory. Ministers, theologians, and churches do not stand today because they do not love Jesus Christ. They do not love Jesus Christ supremely. And he, Jesus Christ himself, said, If you do not love me more than all, you do not love me at all. This was Martin Luther. This was why he was the reformer of the church. This still leaves Luther only a figure to be admired by us, or at best, a servant of God for whom we thank God. But Luther is more than this, and he must be more than this to us. He must be example and encouragement to the church today, exactly as the man of conviction. Luther was Christ's man in the 16th century, at that crucial moment in the history of the church. He was the believer and the office bearer in whom the risen Christ dwelt and through whom the Spirit of Christ worked for the reform of the church. The explanation of Martin Luther is not Martin Luther himself at all. The explanation of that remarkable man is Jesus Christ in that remarkable man. That's why Luther 
loved the truth. That's why Luther loved the church. And that's why Luther loved God revealed in Jesus Christ. That's why Luther stood as a man of conviction. Christ upheld him in that great struggle in church history. <coughs> Luther knew that. He knew he was Christ's man. And that all he did was by the spirit of Christ within him who founded him upon the revelation of Christ in Scripture. He confessed that in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress. I'm quoting it now from the original version of A Mighty Fortress, not necessarily in the popular English version with which we are familiar. I quote that Luther hymn. And notice in the quotation how Luther himself recognized and acknowledged that the work was all the work of Christ within him. By our own strength is nothing won. We court at once disaster. There fights for us the champion whom God has named our master. Would you know his name? Lord Sabaoth is he. No other God can be. The field is his to hold it. End quote. This Christ, this Jesus Christ, is ours as well today as he was Luther's in the 16th century. This Christ is ours when the enemies of the church, the battle of the church, and the calling of the church are the same today as they were in Luther's day. What are the issues before the church today? The authority of the inspired scripture the sovereign grace of God in salvation rather than the free will of the sinner. A spiritual kingdom as opposed to a carnal kingdom. A religion of the word of God in opposition to the charismatic movement. And the unity of the church grounded solidly upon oneness in doctrine rather than church union on the basis of friendly feelings for each other. The issues confronting the church today are not merely similar to the issues that confronted the church in Luther's day. They are the same issues. We must take a stand. We must take a stand. We must be children of God who assert truths, assert them. We must be men and women of conviction, loving the church, loving the truth, and loving Jesus Christ. Especially the pastors and other office bearers must take a stand today. Will we? Will we take a stand? I have no doubt that some will, at least one man, in one church, Christ never leaves himself altogether without a witness and a champion. I'm confident of that. For there fights for us the champion, and the field is his to hold it. Thank you for your attention.